So we've had a few chapters now on this process of mobilization, action, media, developing a system of, of, of connections uh, in our organizational space. And one way of describing this as, is as a funnel. People are coming in, things happen, then other things happen, then they do something else, and then something else happens, and they do something else, and then they funnel back, and the process starts again, and more people are coming in. So it's, this is the idea of a dynamo, right? It's a sort of iterative, dynamic, circular system, and each time you go around the circle, the thing grows bigger. It's a positive feedback loop, as you might say. And there's two fundamental phrases which work synergistically with each other. They combine and interact for mutual advantage, which is going to potentially shock some of you because in our sort of received culture of progressive activism or whatever, the ideological position is that they're, they're two separate things. And I'm going to be arguing quite strongly that, yes, they can be, but often if you get the design right, they're actually uh, come together and we can move beyond a rather sterile debate. So the first concept is the re a return on investment, right? Which has a whole capitalistic, you know, nasty ambience to it. And then there's this notion of community building, which has this like more pleasant, yeah, we're all coming together, isn't this nice sort of ambience to, about it. So what I'm going to try and sort of propose here, I'm not proposing, I'm arguing, and I'm pretty sure I'm right, dare I say it, is that these two things are actually very similar. So let's take this idea of return on investment. So return on investment, you know, this is all about banks and big companies. But if we actually get down to the essence of it, what it basically means is, is you do something with a plan of getting something out. Um, and this doesn't have to be intrinsically tricky. In fact, to a certain extent, we do it a million times a day. So to take a sort of example, if you've got your guy in the Amazon and he's going out, you know, shooting birds with his bow and arrow or whatever, he might go to one area of the forest and then there's less birds there to shoot after two or three weeks and then he moves on to another area of the forest. That doesn't make him some prototypical capitalist exploiter. All he's doing is he's just making a fairly calculative and necessary um, a cognitive move, as you might say, of going, yeah, there's not that many birds, I'm going over somewhere else. This, this happens all the time. So this process is intrinsic. It's not alien. It's intrinsic to the human experience and it needs to be in, in, integrated into it. And in this system, which is fast moving, an iterative and we're trying to get somewhere to this super fast moving revolution. This notion of studying what works is super important. And obviously with the community, you know, community building idea, we have this sort of concept of people sitting in a circle, you know, sharing their lives and eating food together and the whole sociability thing. And what I'm going to be saying is that this, these, these sites of sociability, this community building process is, is builds upon and feeds back into this more statistical calculative orientation. So this should sound shocking because for the last, you know, 10 chapters or whatever, we've been juxtaposing this notion of instrumental rationality with this sociability situ situation. But there's a, some concrete ways in which a central group or a leadership group uses instrumental rationality to actually provide greater spaces of sociability. So, for instance, we discussed in the last chapter that the, the meeting spaces are designed in such a way so they can't be taken over by unpleasant people. So they're sort of protected. 
um, there's a growth system so that uh, there's more spaces for sociability, for instance. So you can see that the hopefully you can see there's some sort of synergistic relationship here. And it's, they're not a necessary uh, contradiction. There are contradictory elements, but again, because we're having this complexity orientation to our analysis, it shouldn't surprise us that they're synergistic and conflicting at the, at the same time. And the design name of the game is to tease out in, in more micro detail when the relationship is productive or how to create the productive relationship and how to minimise the unproductive relationship. Um, and the essence of doing that is to get your hands dirty. In other words, you can't do this in a university seminar. You can't do it, you know, discussing it on social media. You can't write a book about it. What you have to do is actually get into the space itself, right? And this is the role of, of coordinating leadership, is, is to be there on the day, handing out the leaflets, talking to people and getting feedback and what have you. Um, all right, so let's, so we're hopefully established, I'm not going to be apologetic about this return on investment orientation and hopefully you can see it's actually super exciting in a minute. What we're doing is we're going into this civil resistance space. We're looking at concretely what's happening. We're looking at the details, the minute details of what goes on and we're producing numbers that quantify elements of that system, right? The numbers don't, don't completely define that system. It's just a interpretation and it has a certain functionality as we will see. In other words, like there needs to be some sort of like professionalism around this, right? It's not, hey, we're gonna have this event, you know, blah, blah, blah. it's like, no, this is what we're doing. These are the details, these are the numbers. We're getting an, an assessment of it. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about statistics. Statistics has, you know, quite an ambiguous status in the history of radical thought. And there's a sort of, you know, this, as I said, this sort of sterile debate between the romantic left and the rationalist left, as you might say. So you've got plenty of people, um, you know, who make clear statistics is actually a, is actually a, a revolutionary mechanism. So there's a guy called Dubois, I think, this uh, black guy in the early 20th century. And he was saying, words to the effect, one of the things he said is, if we're going to have black liberation, we need to know the statistics of the oppression. We need to know that, you know, what their employment situation is in the numbers. We need to know how many people are being lynched. We need to know how many people uh, uh, are not allowed to vote. You see what I mean? So it's like there's numbers there. These numbers are important because they actualize in a concrete way the, the reality of the oppression. And similarly, there was these Roundtree, um, um, Cadbury's and Roundtree, these big, this big Quaker company, they did these reports in the late 19th century. And a lot of, you know, entitled liberals were going, yeah, there's poverty, but it's not that bad and it's more complicated. And they did these really good reports and said, you know, 80% of the people in London have no sanitation, you know, you know, 70% of people uh, unemployed, you know, six months of the year, whatever it was. And there were shocking statistics. So this is, this informational statistical element is important, right? It is important. I know this sounds like I'm contradicting myself. But it's not the only game in town. That's the point. So here there's a process. If you're looking at a system, you know, the first step is descriptive statistics. How many people came to the meeting last night? 20. It's a description. It's a quantitative description of what happened. Then the next statistical move is a, town, a time series. What that means is how many people came last week? Oh, 10 people came last week, you know, 20 people came this week and we're expecting 30 next week. Oh, it's going up, up, important information. That leads to the question, why, why is it going up? 
So then you do a statistical investigation of a relationship between two descriptive um, uh, groups of stats. And you know, this is fairly straightforward, but it's important you get the, the fundamentals of what we're trying to do here. So I go to, say, go to Joe and he's saying, yeah, there was 20 people came to the meeting last week. 40 people came to the meeting this week. So now I want to know what was the causal factor that allowed those 40 people to come this week? And he says, well, last week we delivered 2,000 leaflets and this week we delivered 4,000. So it's a reasonable hypothesis. Obviously, it's not totally proven, but it's a reasonable hypothesis. The extra 2,000 leaflets brought in an extra 20 people. Now, then you go and replicate that, you know, several times, let's say 10 times, and you get a, a causal relationship between the leaflets produced and leaflets delivered and the number of people turning up to the meeting. That's an absolutely critical like analysis for designing a system, right? The architecture of this system. And we're going to populate it with sociability in a minute. But this is critical because it allows you to know what you need to do. Just like the guy in the rainforest is going, that area isn't producing you know, enough food, so we're going to move to the, to the next area. And um, that's the decision. Okay, so let's like just plow into some concrete stuff and I'm going to give you a few stats which may or may not be the case, you know, these are broadly correct but I'm not saying it's the last word on the matter. The point of providing these stats isn't to actually give you the numbers, it's to give you like what a statistical system looks like. So here we go, let's plow through it. If we deliver five to 10,000 leaflets, we get 20 people to come to a meeting. Uh, 10 of those people will go and do non-violence training. Two of them will end up going to do civil disobedience. If there's 20 people in the room, five of those people will give a donation. They'll give a donation of an average of 20 pounds each, and that produces 100 pounds per meeting of regular monthly donations. After they've gone to the first meeting, they go to a social afterwards. At this social, they are then encouraged to go to a film night, uh, resilience to resist, a sort of you know therapeutic space where people can share their fears. And if we do this, then we get three or four people going in the road rather than two. Um, then they go on the action, they have a debrief afterwards. If they go on to the debrief, then if there's 10 people on the debrief after the action, three of those people will carry on and do the action again. Okay, so we've got here, you know, we've got this funnel, they're coming in, they get the leaflet, they go to non-violence, they go to the welcoming meeting about the climate crisis or whatever the social or ecological issue is. Um, then they're going through a series of sociability steps, as you might say, and then they're going on the road and engaging in civil disputes. And this is all a funnel. And if you look at the previous chapters on all of this, you can see how the designs worked out to maximise sociability and proximity and you get more people, people going. And then feeding into this is a whole bunch of other, you know, other or other, other moves which are, you know, arguably not as important, but could be because uh, we don't know unless we have the stats, of course. So then we have sectional meetings, you know, meetings with Christians, meeting with trade unionists, meetings with the black community. They feed in uh, to this process, a bit like geographical based meetings. Then we have like cultural Zooms, you know, Jeremy Corbyn turns up or some big, big um, uh, public figure, you know, a thousand people turn up. 10% of those people will go to non-violence training, you know, blah, blah, blah. Then we have uh, social media adverts, so we spend a thousand pounds on Facebook or on some social media platform. Um, let's say we spend 250 pounds, that means five people turn up to an online Zoom meeting, two of those people go in the road, you know, two of them give a donation, that's 40 pounds, let's say, uh, so you make your money back in 10 weeks, 10, 15 weeks. Uh, maybe we do student mobilisation, we go onto the campuses, we hand out 5,000 leaflets, that gets an average of 15 people into a room, five of those people will end up doing non-violence training and, and going in the road. Uh, again, there's film nights, you know, parties, all this sort of stuff that is designed in. So, there you've got a whole load of descriptive stats and you can see there's some relationships between them. If we do this, we get this. If we 
if we you know, have a certain number of public figures, we'll get a thousand people. If we deliver these leaflets, you know, if we make these phone calls afterwards, all of this has to be written down. And so you can see it clearly on a, on a, a spreadsheet and you can start to identify relationships. The next step is then you go to your funder, okay? Or you basically do a plan to get it up to critical, critical mass. So arguably we need, you know, one and a half thousand people in the UK to create a major political event and or win. Um, let's say it's 3,000 arrests. That's one and a half thousand people, um, you know, getting arrested twice, which is what we might predict again on the basis of description of, of, of the statistical situation. OK, so let's then move into move into trying to scale this up. So we've got this feedback loop. If this happens, this you get this many people, so you can go and do it again and you get more people and such like. So let's scale it up. Let's, let's say, for instance, if you have 40 meetings a week, we're going, to get, um, we're going to get two people from each of those meetings to go into civil resistance. So that's 80 people. Let's have 10, meeting, 10 weeks of a campaign. So you're going to have 800 people. And then you're going to do social media and various other people, and you've got people in your system anyway. And that's going to produce the next eight, the next 800 people. So you've got up to, let's say, one and a half thousand people. They're going to end up getting arrested on an average of two times each. That gets you your free, the 3,000 arrests on the assumption that's what you're going for. And to do 40 meetings a week, arguably you need 160 people. You need four full-time or part-time people to do all the preparation, running and follow up from, the, from a meeting. So if you have 40 meetings, four people per meeting, you need 160 people. You go and cost how much, it, how much, it, 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 how much money it takes to employ those uh, 160 people. And broadly speaking in the Western world, you know, the analysis I have that one and a half million pounds will produce enough mobilization through this rigorous statistical prediction system to be in the ballpark, let's say, a 50% chance of breaking through and changing legislation. OK, now the point here is not those numbers, right? You might be thinking, oh, is that right? Oh, you know, where we are, we don't get such, such good results. That's not what I'm trying to say here. What I'm trying to do is communicate the process through which you discover what the stats are and you use those stats to make a prediction. Um, and then, of course, you can go to your funder with two pages of headline stats and say, look, you know, we can change the world. We can force legislative change. We can create a, a, a revolutionary like moment in a Western society. This basically is how much it costs, which doesn't mean it exactly costs that much. Right. It just means it's in the ballpark. And it gives the funder, you know, who's some big cultural figure, let's say, or some businessman who's had a nervous breakdown or whatever it is, you're not going to get money for foundations for this sort of thing as a general rule. They're going to look at this and they're going to go, right, that's, that's, um, that's credible. And the success we've had in A22 and, you know, just to pull on all these organisations, the reason we've been successful is because we've been able to produce stats. And that's because the stats, the stats have been robust. And the reason the stats are being robust is we have a system to collect the statistics. So this is like a major cultural shift in this sort of activist situation to actually producing things. So for the sake of argument, there's another, the, there's, yeah, there's, two, there's two other dynamics here. There's two specific dynamics. So one of, one of them, yeah, one of them is is getting donations. So what's interesting about getting donations, of course, is you create, create this positive feedback, feedback loop. So you have a meeting, there's 20 people in the meeting, you know, they, 10 of them give 20 pounds each, let's say, um, no, that's wrong. Let's say five of them give <laughs> 20 pounds each. So that's a hundred pound, that's, that's a thousand pounds, uh, sorry, that's a hundred pounds. And then you're gonna have 10 meetings. 
So you're approximately going to have a thousand pounds of regular donations coming out of that meeting and maybe a funder is going to support you, you're going to get up to £1,500. So at the end of that meeting, at the end of those 10 meetings every week, you're going to be able to take on another full-time mobiliser on £1,500 a week. Now, if you put that into a spreadsheet, right? You know, I put that into a spreadsheet, we've got 10 or 20 meetings, whatever it is, they produce enough money to take on one person a week, and that one person then produces more meetings, so then you're getting more money, so you can take on more people who will produce more meetings, which will produce more money, right? So you put that into a spreadsheet and the spreadsheet I got came out, you originally got like 20 people doing mobilising. At the end of the year, you've got 280 people doing mobilising. Yeah, that is right, 280 people, because that's the nature of exponential like systems. Same thing with the Arctic, same thing with lots of different systems, is once the thing takes off, then it's going like that, which is the key reason, right? The key and absolutely critical reason in this series of, of uh, episodes is, is, is to make clear this is, this is absolutely central. Once you produce a positive feedback loop, you're on the go. And if you want to know the secret of the success, of the campaigns I've been organised in, it's all about this, right? Well, it's not all about this, obviously, but it's like central to to the, the system is to go, okay, you know, let's get some, let's get those ten meetings, let's get that money in, let's take those people on, and let's churn it around. And no doubt, no doubt, it's not going to be two hundred and eighty-eight people, right? You know, it could be more, but it's quite possibly be less. But it's going to be super empowering and exciting because the thing's going somewhere, and as we've said. Let's say we need 160 people to actually run the show to get to, you know, change in legislation in Western society. Maybe after six to nine months, you've got that number of people because you've vigorously and professionally uh, focused on enacting this, this, this uh, process. So another variation on the theme is volunteers. So this is the other feedback loop, which is you have a meeting and you have a certain system which enables, encourages and supports people, two people to do, you know, one night of volunteering for you each, each week. And they go and deliver leaflets and knock on the doors or do the meeting. And then the same maths applies, of course, which is in each meeting, you get some volunteers. So the following week you can do, another, you know, you can do five meetings rather than four. And then, you know, blah, 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 blah. And, you know, at the end of the process, you've got, you know, 500 volunteers and you've got 100 meetings a week. The point is that this can be systematised. That's what we're doing. We're systematising it, okay? So the next question, of course, is are these numbers robust? And in so much as they're not that great, how can you improve them? Or even if they are good, how can we improve these ratios? So this requires this central team to collect the statistics centrally so you can look at who's doing well, work out why they're doing that well, and then spread that, that system throughout, that new practice throughout the system. So for instance, you know, if, um, if one group is phoning people the following day and they're getting 50% of people giving donations and all the other groups are phoning people three days later and getting 20% of people to give donations, then you change the policy. The policy is you phone people uh, the following day. Now, the other groups might be sceptical. And the beauty of statistics is you've got objective uh, information to show that this is more effective, broadly speaking. The second thing, of course, is that the group that's doing really well can then horizontally, as you might say, uh, empower those groups by going, oh, the guys in Bedford are going to ring up the guys in Newcastle and give them the lowdown on how you know how you phone people, the script you use, make sure you speak to people the day after, and then the new group phones them up and they're suddenly all excited because their numbers have improved. In other words, the whole focus here is on collective design, collective empowerment. It's not about telling people off, it's about providing concrete information. In other words, the statistical information empowers, it doesn't disempower, because it's used in order to, to create this mission 
this process of more and more people getting involved and then having increased spaces of sociability and what have you. Um, so some of the variations on the theme is, you know, as we've said a hundred times now, this is an, an iteration. Each week is a new iteration. Each week or each month, you're going to get new, new information. You have a campaign and then you repeat the campaign and, and, you, and you learn from it. And your people who are coordinators, they're providing information, they're providing training, they're going around the groups and they're mentoring people, as I mentioned in the last chapter. Then you're getting feedback from people. Uh, you go and visit the, 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 the teams. And as I said, there's this, this horizontal process. Um, okay. So, you know, some of you might still be thinking, oh, this sounds a little bit brutal numbers, Roger stuff. <laughs> but what I'm hoping to have persuaded you is, is this is totally non-negotiable. If you're going to systematically create uh, an upward spiral of, of, uh, of civil resistance activities. Yes, we're going to discuss in the next chapter, you know, a big whirlwind comes along and everyone goes to the street. We'll cross that bridge when we come to it. This is what you might call in normal, repressed, pre-revolutionary times. This is the process that maximises the probability you can get, you know, 500 of ours and 10,000 people on, on the street. Um, and because it's creating a bigger system, it's creating more people entering into a sociability space. So what, what we've been talking about here is like one analogy is we're talking about designing the tree. It's the core architecture. It's the core looping of, of the system. And then you've got all the leaves, right? So the leaves we might, you know, for the sake of argument, we're going to call the leaves the sociability. So within that hard architecture, you have to have spend just as much time creating a sociability design within it. And the sociability design is not opposed to the instrumental rationality in so much as it provides the, the culture and the support and the empowerment for people, obviously, to go to the next step. So you can see, hopefully, how these things work together. So I'm going to just give some, you know, remind you, in so much as you've forgotten about these things or don't know about them, some micro designs that increases the sociability. So, for instance, when you have these meetings, you've got these 40 meetings a week and in you know, six months, you're going to have 100 meetings a week. But those meetings are not just any old meetings. They're already pre-designed for sociability. So, for instance, in the meeting, you always have a check-in. So you used to have 40 meetings with a check-in. Now you've got 100 meetings. But they've all got this check-in, right, which basically humanises the meeting. Everyone says, you know, what's going on, and everyone goes, goes, goes around. You have some sort of acknowledgement or ceremony where people get a badge or they get some thing which signifies that they've joined this community and they're valued and they've gone through some sort of stage. Again, this isn't some reductive gamification routine. It's a process of community building, creating connection, solidity, and oh, great, you know, this whole team's gone out and done a slow march. You come back, everyone gets this little badge. Everyone thinks it's a bit of a joke, of course. It's always presented, should be presented as a bit of a, you know, lighthearted thing. But there's a serious psychological point here, which is that the people like to have this acknowledgement and, re and recognition. There's a training program so people can learn how to do all these skills. And this involves role playing. So role playing is a way in which people enter their body. They're actually doing things and it makes them more committed to the project and connected to each other. There's a pet talk. So someone comes into the meeting, you know, it's no one special. It's someone who used to just be some average guy with an average job and he comes in and says I used to do an average job and now I'm not because things are fucked and we're all going to work together. So you've got ordinary people talking to ordinary people again within this statistically designed feedback loop. Um, you have resilience to resist sessions or similar sessions where people are coming together and they're saying I'm scared I don't really know what I want to do this. You know, I've never done this before. I'm getting hassle from my family. 
you know, at this time of life, I shouldn't be doing it. I'm trying to get, get a career or I've retired now. I've done my bit, you know, voice all these fears. And you go around in the, in the circle and everyone's going, oh, my God, other people are scared as me. And the paradox is that that facilitates a collective empowerment because everyone goes, OK, we're all in the same boat. There's nothing special about me. We're all going to go for it. Uh, film, you know, film nights, you know, watching the Children's March or Freedom Summer, all these great documentaries about people in the past who've done done great things. Um, you know, you come out of the film and just going, yeah, this is what I want to do. This is what we're going to do together. Uh, house meetings, bringing people into your home and saying, look, I'm just an ordinary guy. We're going to watch this video. You know, we're all going to come together. We're going to have this revolutionary episode. Everyone knows it's fucked. Here's some ordinary people talking about it. Everyone has, you know, tea and biscuits. Everyone knows each other. OK, we're all going to go out together. Uh, uh, open telephone calls. You know, everyone gets together. They eat pizza together. Then they go and make their telephone calls. They stop after 45 minutes. Everyone has a little bitch about someone, you know, who was particularly unpleasant. Everyone bonds over it. In other words, the hard architecture is softened through this sociability design at every stage, OK? So we're not saying, oh, we're going to do phoning, you know. Here's your list, Joe. Go off and do phoning. We're saying, hey, Joe, come and have a pizza. Oh, and we're going to do some phoning as well. You see how that works? So it's like you've got the branch and then you're covering it with all these leaves, which obviously humanises the whole process. OK, so the broader context here is, is you've got clarity. So as we talked about in the last chapter, the clarity part of this is, is this is our aim. This is what we're trying to achieve. We're trying to do something concrete. We're trying to get 2,000 people to go to London. This is how we're going to do it. This is your role in it. This is, this is the role of the, of the leadership, the core group, is to define it. Not in 20 pages, but in two pages. This is what we're going to do. People don't need to know the details. They want to know broadly what the, what the plan is and their role in the plan. So the clarity that you're the mobilisation group. On Tuesday, Wednesdays and Thursdays, you're going out leafleting and you're going to do one meeting a week. I'm going to check in with you every 48 hours or whatever. If you've got any questions, that's fine. Once you're on the go, you're on the go. And we should be getting these results. If you don't, don't panic about it. I'll be here to help. Or you can get advice from other groups. If you're doing really well, then you can get Group of the Year Award sort of thing, you know, special multicolored badge. <laughs> uh, and then uh, you're going to help other, other groups. It's got an action focus. You know, this is not just a talk shop. So people are moving their bodies. They get empowered. They're going to go to debriefs. They're going to go back, do more leafleting, speak to their, their peer group get these people in, go and do it again. It's all statistically like monitored for the reasons we've discussed. OK, so a lot of people watching this will be go, well, Roger, you know, we tried this, we tried leafleting, we tried phoning people, it doesn't really work. So there's two things to say about that. Number one is nonlinear processes always involve a long linear grind, right? We've talked about this in other chapters, but just to remind you, if you need reminding, right? It's really difficult to get that feedback loop to get going. When it gets going, get to an inflection point and it's going to take off, right? And it might be slow and it might not even work. But the key question here is not, oh, Roger, it doesn't really work. That's a bollocks question as we've discussed several times, right? The question is, is what else are you going to do? You're going to sit in your bed sit and be miserable. Well, sitting in your bed sit being miserable is zero return on investment, right? <laughs> so it's far better to grind away and get one person in a meeting to, you know, recruit them because after 10 meetings, you've got 10 people. So don't think about the one meeting and the one person. Think about the 10 meetings. Don't think, just think about the 10 meetings. Think once you've got 10 meetings and 10 people, there's a good 50-50 chance you're going to have free volunteers. And in half a year's time, you're going to be on the go. And you never know, there might be some big ecological crisis and then you're going to have a thousand people in your meeting and you're going to have the opposite problem, which is how the hell do you organise these people? Um, yeah. And the other thing is people say, oh, you know, this process doesn't work because, you know, this Western country is different, you know, my, my area is different. There's two reasons why that's not the case. 
The first reason is we've got a global crisis and it's affecting everyone, right? Wherever you are on planet Earth at the moment, you know, billions of people shitting themselves because they're going, oh my God, you know, something needs to happen. That's point one. Point two is, dare I say, sociability dynamics are human universals. You know, yep, there's different cultural forms, absolutely. But the fundamentals of humanity are the same across the board. People want to be attended to, they want to be loved, they want to be recognised, they want to give attention to other people, you know, they want to be part of a community, they want to give love. These, these are the fundamentals and everything that we're describing here is based on these fundamentals and yet there's going to be some cultural variation. All right, so the last thing I'll say is, the other problem of course is, you're so successful as I said, is you've got all these people and then they, they, they combine into some solid inert mass. <laughs> so you get, build a big movement, you've got 100,000 people and the movement becomes more important than the aim of the movement. And you see this over and over again. I'm sure many of you know what I'm talking about. So this is the paradox of political uh, identity. We talked about it again uh, before. And this is, again, the role of strategic leadership. The strategic leadership comes in and says, no, we're not doing that campaign anymore. We're going to do this. No, we're not going to do that method of campaigning anymore. We're going to do this on the basis of statistical uh, research. Uh, and because you've got this leadership structure, you can pivot, you can be more strategically coherent and you can outmaneuver the bad guys. And we all know the bad guys are really bad and they're going to get worse. So this is all important stuff. All right. Thanks.